Performance Expo viewers. Me and Jimmy are back at it again. This time we're at your shop, the old Hot Rod Garage, home of the, what is it, 200 mile an hour? How fast that truck go out there? Uh, it's been 262. Just 262. So this is where Wayne and you guys hang out, work on the truck, to get ready to go to Bonneville. Right. I saw your red hat at the table over there. Maybe, maybe I may show that later. But short blocks pretty much together, or rotating assemblies together, trying to get the cam in the block and try to get this thing put together enough to deliver it out to Ben's. But, you know, we've already run into one issue this morning related to tolerance stack. So talk a little bit, Jimmy, about that issue because it's an issue, isn't it? Well, the problem we had was the, the cam thrust plate was just too thick. It didn't have mm -hmm. any clearance in it. So, right. uh, and it was all between the nose of the camshaft and uh, spacing on the gear for the roller bearing on the gear. So what we had to do was sand the thrust plate down to get our inflate. <laughs> you know, actually, Lake did it, but uh, we had to sand it down, sand about five thousandths off of it to get any clearance at all in it, which with a roller thrust bearing, it doesn't need any clearance. It can be zero, but it doesn't need to be preloaded. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so uh, we had to sand it where it has one to three thousandths clearance in it, and we finally got that after a couple of hours here. But uh, yeah, when it's a hardened plate, you got to sand it in a flat plate. It's, it goes pretty yeah, slow. It, 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 you're taking tenths of a thousandths off. And, with 220 grit sandpaper and a flat plate, you're, you're struggling a little bit. But we got that done, and uh, then we got the cam in it and the, checked the degree on it, and mm -hmm. it's a 112 degree load separation cam. Uh, they did not put what the intake center line was on it, so uh, I have to check that, which we haven't done yet. But we did go ahead and put the intake center line in and it checks at 110 the way it is, mm -hmm. straight up with the, the set we got, which I think is probably a good starting point. Uh, we can always move it from there, but we're going to go ahead and try to put some checking springs on our heads and see what our piston to valve looks like before we go moving the cam one way or the other. Well, one thing I like how you set your checking this is that you're actually using the actual lifter and checking your travel from the lifter. Well, because this has a 937 keyway type lifter in mm -hmm. it, it probably has an, eight, an 850 wheel on it. And if you've got a 785 or a 750 or an 850 wheel, depending on what the cam's ground for, it will change your numbers. It won't, it won't change your over the nose number and it won't change anything else, but it will change all your numbers at 50 and at 200 and 100, it will right. change all, all of that stuff. based yeah. off the size of the wheel of the lifter. Uh, your max lift and that won't vary because it's off the base circle. Right. So, had a little bit of tolerance stack issue. You said it's something you, you deal with pretty regular, right? That yeah. All the parts are in spec, but that's the whole problem. There's a target value and there's a plus minus and if everything stacks the wrong direction, you don't have any. You don't have any clearance. Yeah, and clearance, clearance, clearance. Clear, yeah. Clearance is very important. He's your buddy, for it, certain. It, it definitely needs clearance. Uh, tight generally doesn't work. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Usually not a good thing. No. It's so, all right, so the next thing we're gonna do, like I said, put the checking springs, on the heads and then see what we got the piston the valve and see what next hurdles we have to come over. Check piston the valve and see what our rock arm geometry looks like and what length push rod we're going to need and uh, just basically check the cylinder head out and make sure that we got the proper scrub on the tip of the valve and everything. All right, so we better get on to the next part. We're putting those checking springs on and see what we got and we'll be back in a little bit.
Okay, so Jimmy, we've checked piston to valve. Thank goodness we have plenty of piston to valve. All right. No concern there, right? No concern there. All right, so that part's done. So now we got to get on and putting on what, pan rails. We got an oil pump to put on. What are we going to do next? We're going to put on pan rails, put the rear, install the rear cover. Mm -hmm. We're going to uh, pull our cam bolts out, lock tight them, and torque them. Because we have our cam where we're going to leave it for now. And then we're going to put the front cover on, and then we'll put the, uh, well, we're going to put the rear cover, the pan rails, oil pump. and the oil pump, and then we'll put the front cover on and the oil pan. All right, so we got a little bit of work to do, so you guys can watch along as we move forward here. Right. So we've got our lifters back out so they don't fall on the floor when we turn the motor over. And uh, we're basically going to take the rest of this stuff off the front of the motor because we're done with it. All right, let's get at it. See the slack in this gear right here? Yes. Well, you want to take that slack out of there too if you can. All right, so you're shimming between. I'm shimming between the gear and the crank drop. Got it. To center that up. All right, then we're going to shim between. the housing and the outer gear to center of the housing. There you go, now all of a sudden. And now, you've got one and a half to twos. Those are one and a half to twos. Plus you got some drag in here. Mm -hmm. so this is centered on the crank gear. This is centered on the outer gear, and you can see there's very little slack in there now. Right. But once we torque this down and pull these out, those should not contact the cover. Right. They should be set. They should be set. Now these should pull out pretty easy. Now you can see your gears are free. They'll move. There's no drag on the gear whatsoever, so the housing should be centered. So Jimmy's been working overtime and we've got the bottom end of the engine together. Got the oil pan on there and all that stuff you saw in the previous uh, section of this video. So now we got the head studs. We're putting all the studs in so we can get the heads on. So a little bit of progress, right Jimmy? 
a little bit of progress. Uh, Dart sent us the correct head stud kit for this block. Um, <clears throat> got the lifters in it. Um, got the right head gaskets. We can go ahead and put the heads on it and torque them up, but we've got a little debacle on the rocker arms. Yeah, we're not quite there on the rocker arm yet, so more than likely what's going to happen is the next time you see this engine, it will be at Ben Schrader's place and it'll be finished up. So we got a little bit more work to do. Like I said, Jimmy said, we got to get the fish, getting all the head studs in, get the uh, head gaskets on, at least get the heads bolted in, and then we can worry about the rocker arm issue because we started looking at it, right, with the the double spring, the spring race we're running, the rocker arms we were looking at, which were the stamped steel or the stamped cast rocker, not that stamp, but really. Well, it's the factory, cast. it's the factory rocker. Yeah, the factory cast rocker probably isn't the best piece. Yeah, we got. For that much spring pressure, right? Yeah, we got between six and 700 pounds of pressure across the nose. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if they'll stay, stay in there or not. Right, so as opposed to risking it, Right. We decided just go ahead and put on, you know, a, a little beefier, stronger rocker arm. That's a stud mount, so that's what we're trying to figure out: is how we got to mount those rockers. We've got the rockers; we just got to figure out how to get them mounted correctly, and we'll get that figured out and done. It'll be in the, it'll be on the engine when it gets to Ben's. But for now, we got to kind of take yeah. a couple more steps, get a little bit closer to being done, and then. Of course, Ben's got to do all that real hard work. He's got all the wiring and all that kind of stuff to do. Well, the wiring shouldn't be that bad. The Pro Charger might be a, a different hookup. But that's a lot of parts. That's a lot of parts. Yeah, I was noticing that. That's a lot of parts. And it's not, it's a belt driven uh, yes. Pro Charger. It's not a crank driven Pro Charger. Correct. So it's a little bit easier that way because you can, and it's the fact that it's not in a car, you can mount it pretty much wherever you want it. I mean, it looked like you opened the box and a hardware store fell out. It's got a lot of pieces to right. it. It was a big box, but uh, and as far as the drive on it, it drives off the ATI dampener on the front. Okay. So it's got six bolts in it instead of three. And oh, the dampener just for that reason? Just for that reason. So we got double keys and six, six bolts, bolts on the damper because it's pulling the Pro Charger. Right. And you can change the pulleys to speed it up or slow it down. So how much we boost have you a couple of sets of pulleys with it yeah. too. So, so that? that that should be relatively straightforward. Of course, there's nothing but straightforward on this engine so far. No, <laughs> no. Like I said, when you tolerance stack is an issue, right? When, you, when you're buying a rotating assembly and they've already figured all that stuff out, that's one thing. When you buy all the parts individually and you put them all together, it yeah, makes for some... Yeah, it makes for some interesting machine work. Yeah. Um, the fact that the lifter bushings were already in the block and all that sure helped. But we still have had, you know, piston and valve issue to look at and uh, deck clearance issues to look at. And even the, the timing chain didn't line up perfectly. <laughs> right. We had the machine a little bit on it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, other than that. Okay, double row versus single row. It's yes. all, all those little things. When you put a double row chain in, you got to space the oil pump out and then it don't necessarily clear the cover. Right. <laughs> so. You got to rub on it. The elbow, uh, shin bones connected to the knee bones, yeah, something like not, that, I think. Yeah, thing not, that nothing uh, just bolts together at this point. Uh, no. <laughs> that has been the lesson so far with this engine is nothing just bolted together pretty easy. Right. Because, you know, again, combination of parts, trying to do something different, different and interesting, and therefore we've had some interesting and different things and, to do. And that's the whole purpose of this is to show what can happen. Right. Yeah, and not make it Hollywood where, oh, look, it just happened miraculously and easy. No, we're trying to show you that sometimes things aren't easy and you have to have some creative machine work. <laughs> well, uh, you, you have to make it fit. And, right. Uh, uh, ready, ready to race parts are not generally ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, some things are easier than others, and in this case, you know, it took, took a little bit of work, but we're getting there. Yeah, so we're getting there. It's, it's taken, taken quite a bit of time, but we're getting there. And I think once we get there, we'll be happy with the re final results. I think so, too. Looking forward to seeing it run. So with that case, we need to go ahead and stop running our mouth. 
put some more farts on so we can get this thing a little bit closer to being done so we can get it on here and get it out in the bin so we can do this part and you'll see that in the next video. Welcome back to the Engine Performance Expo live from Piney Flats, Tennessee at Straub Technologies. We got Mark Cronquist back in the studio, Lake, and we're going to talk a little, uh, little hard parts here with the folks from Precision Products. They were unable to make it, but we've got super sub Mr. Cronquist. Well, he's a lifetime user, right? A this lifetime is user of Precision Products products, so yes. So I, I know what they are, but he knows why they're good, so yes. I figured we'd bring Mark along. What they yes. are, why they're good. So uh, talk about our flat tappet lifter here, Mark, because I know that's where I first heard about these guys or within the J G R realm, right? Yeah. I've known because Leo Jackson, who's a car owner, NASCAR yes, legend, yes, yes. been around forever. This is his company. Yes, him and his, his daughter Debbie. So uh, the lifters are something that they started building when uh, I guess the quality of you could say the quality and the material just the NASCAR motor far past mm -hmm. though so yeah the, the leo RPM and a, and you yes, were going to you just couldn't use yes, the leo the stepped shelf. up and he started building his own his own lifter made out mm -hmm. of material and really 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 perfected the crown and the radius which is the most important part of the lifter really because the way you trying to get the lift out of a flat tap is you get to the edge right so that radius really has to be important the taper to match the crown or, and the taper of the camshaft. So the crown mm -hmm. of the lifter matches the taper, all that. They're really good. They've really perfected that. The surface finish is unreal right. from them. Uh, we are taking and we are coating them with DLC after we get them mm -hmm. from them. So they may supply, I don't know for sure, but they may supply coated. They, they do. Okay. They do. Yeah, yeah I know, I know so, back yes. in the day, we yeah. were the company we used yes. uh, at Gibbs, they, yes. they used somebody else. But yeah, yeah, but yeah it's, yes. the, the so. DLC coating these things was also total game changer the total game changer dlc made flat tap and life better not perfect but better, <laughs> better right yeah. now personally myself i'll never build a flat tap and motor again <laughs> in my life but after dealing with all that for all the years in nascar now i'm done with flat tap it so i'm a roller man now so right, no, but uh, yeah they they really uh perfected the making of the lifter so they it. have this available in uncoated and coated yep. just like they have wrist pins wrist pins they, they're great at wrist pins too because really the lifter and the wrist pin you got to look at they both got to be centerless ground they both got to be smooth they both got to be perfect mm -hmm. and precision is a great at doing those products we do get our, our wrist pins from them coated mm -hmm. we run two different sizes they have them coated for us so we don't have to worry about that that's, that's nice. awesome it's, yes it's it's one step that we don't have to take, so that's a good part of that. So, yep. And the other thing is, we were kind of chatting about these. Explain to everybody what what these are, because it looks like a spring seat. Well, and... I'm sitting here looking. I'm saying, why don't I have them? But no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're, I'm sure they're just a bronze, copper bronze seat or something like that. Uh, a lot of people use them to get rid of heat out of the valve train and stuff. Especially right. guys with like steel heads and stuff, they run them, so okay. it helps transfer the heat. Uh, we actually run a, a steel a steel seat, mm -hmm. but uh, and I'm sure they'll make steel seats for you too if you need them. I'm but sure I'm, they do. Yes. I'm sure they do. Yep, yep. Th they just think it's the cool stuff to show off. So. Yes, exactly. So, uh, like I say, you got several wrist pins. You got guides. Mm -hmm. uh, they do do our guides for us. Okay. Uh, they're very good at that too. They're very good at everything, really. But uh, they make your guides for you, whatever you want, lengthwise. They do a lot of custom, but they also make a lot of product parts that they have on their shelf and stuff. And like these are, again, too. some kind of yes. like copper beryllium yes. type Cop alloy yep. piece. Yep, yep. Help and on wear, help on heat transfer and stuff like that, too. So. All right. In the, the previous session, we were uh, when Billy and Ben were here a little bit ago, we were talking about retainers. So uh, they do retainers as well, obviously. Yes, they do tie retainers, and here it looks like that's a, a steel retainer. And they also make the keepers for the retainer, so you get the, the proper angle and the proper fit and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, they got some DLC coated uh, retainers, which I'm sure are tie retainers because mm -hmm. tie and tie don't like to rub against yeah, each yeah, other. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you got to put tie. Uh, the best to do is run a DLC coated or some type of coated tie retainer on a tie uh, retainer. Now th that made me think back to the lifter, tool steel, right? Yes, tool steel. Because we had tool steel lifters with tool steel cams, cams. which is why we had the DLC coat. Yes, the lifter. They don't, yes. Again, the same hardness, same everything. You got you got to be you got to be different there. You exactly. can't have two things, the same material and the same hardness. They don't rub against each other. Very good. So. <laughs> not for very long. No, not not very long. So, 
There's one of their steel seats right there. There we go. Now, on these keepers here, these are kind of interesting. I see a couple of different groove designs in here. Um, what's, what, what we got going on there? Well, you got some that you're trying to put a latch disc in between. Okay. And a lot of times, too, like these ones here, the retainer mm -hmm. is going to, the lock is way up high. Yeah. It's just a surface finish that you're trying to get the, the retainer, the keeper to uh, hold the valve better and stuff right. like that. Okay. So that's a longer, it's a little bit lighter weight system, too, because you'll notice that it's a little bit thinner for certain valves and stuff. That's the good thing about it. They have all types, you know, you got seven millimeters and I'm sure they even got six and the lighter yeah, you yeah. make the retainer, the lighter you can make the keeper and everything else to go with it. So like you said, the surface finish of this is really important because that keeper groove is in the groove on, on, the, on the valve, valve yes. and you don't want yes. to knock the top of the valve off. Right. Really, you don't want the, you don't want the, the groove actually holding the valve. You want when, when it all goes together, you want the clamp of the, like a collet. Right, like yeah. they call it later or something like right. that. You want the you want the surface finishes of the clamp and the taper that clamping. You that just holds it. Basically, you're using the groove to locate it. Locate it on your initial setup is what you're really trying. If you're using the keeper, if you're using the groove to hold your stuff together, yeah, you might want to call Billy and get a different, <laughs> get, get, get a different camp shaft right there. So, yep. Awesome. So, well, excellent. They yep. definitely have found a niche in precision yes yeah the precision product does a great job in precision they do a wonderful job comes back from leo being an s car driver and or mm -hmm. not a driver but an owner and an engine yep. builder he know, he realizes what we need and does a great job at it excellent yep. well we wish that they could have made it out here but hopefully our super sub yep. mr mark cronquist did a great job but uh beautiful parts everyone yep. admiring them thank you very much yes. mark all right lake we're moving along we yep. got a couple more round tables to go but yes. coming up which i'm very excited about by the way and then all day tomorrow here at engineperformanceexpo.com but coming up next we got to keep this thing cool right so CNC machines typically don't run cutting oils because of the speeds they're cutting at to generate a lot of heat. So you use a water-based coolant to do that. Well, just like your pool or your hot tub, guess what? You got to maintain that coolant. So this video is going to tell you how. Hello, Engine Performance Expo viewers. I'm Lake Speed Jr. and I'm here with my buddy Matt Puffin at LN Engineering. So Matt's here, he's the guy that runs these machines that make these parts that go into uh, many different engines. Most of them are going into Porsche, either water-cooled or air-cooled engines. So the tolerances have to be held very close, very precise. So Matt, tell us a little bit about how you guys go about maintaining your coolant and maybe even share a little bit about why maintaining the coolant is so important for what you guys do here. And maintaining the coolant on these machines is important because of surface finish, uh, contamination of the oils, mm -hmm. uh, bacteria growth. Oh yeah, it's a big um, problem. Tool life, of course, because you're mixing chips in with the coolant. So talk a little bit about tool life. It's obviously one of the most expensive parts of maintaining one of these machines is the tools themselves. Which they are expensive, but they also allow a high level of feeds and speeds so that you can have more productivity from the machine. But what have you seen in your experience that relationship between coolant maintenance and tool life? Oh, exactly. The surface finish is most important. Okay. Um, wear on the tools. Mm -hmm. You're recycling chips through the coolant. Right. Um, so essentially a dirty coolant yields shorter tool life and we'll call it worse surface finish. Exactly, yeah. Uh, what, what about dimensionally? Do you see more variance in parts as the coolant ages or gets dirty? Dimensionally? Yes. Uh, maybe a little bit, but not, not terribly. Not terribly? No. So tell us a little bit about the machine yeah. behind this and what's unique about this particular tool and why fluid maintenance is so critical for an application just like this. Well, it's the VF2 Super Speed. Okay. It has through spindle coolant. Right. 1,000 psi. So we're not just spraying coolant around it to the workpiece. It's straight out the bottom. It's coming straight out the bottom. So right at the interface, you've got very high pressure coolant. And there's a five micron filter in the back of the machine, which also okay. filters on top of everything else. All right. So that's a really key thing. So we're not just saying, hey, you got to maintain 
the coolant in terms of having the right ratio of coolant to water, because essentially what the coolant is, it's a oil mixed with water, because water's got great heat capacity, great cooling, doesn't have the best lubricity, that's why we mix in, uh, in this case a synthetic coolant, uh, in, in there to, to do that job, to provide lubrication to the tool so you get the work, you know, the service finish you're looking for. But you maintained a, a really good point there is that you have a filter, a, you said five micron filter? Yeah, five micron. So not only do you have a drag out to carry up the big chips in the back of the machine, you also have a filter. And earlier you mentioned something else that you have in the machines to help keep the fines out of the coolant. What was that? Well, we, there's, a, there's a skimmer built into the machines. Okay. But we also have rare earth magnets attached to every coolant tank. So when you drain the tanks, you're going to see a big bush of metal chips. Oh, wow, nice. Tank. So it keeps it a little more clean. Too. So you got magnets, you've got a filter, you've got skimmer, the skimmer to, to drag out fines that way. And of course, you have the big just drag out to pull the big fines for chips. I should say that. Really fines. Yeah, the skimmer pulls the tramp oils out, comes off the waves, mm -hmm. and when the water evaporates, we'll get a thick film of coolant on the top, so we'll skim that off also. Okay, for those who may not understand that, so the whey oil is what lubricates all the fixturing, correct? Right, so, all the way out of the, the waves. Yeah, yeah, all these things are moving in order to for the part to do its job, right? This thing's cutting, it's moving. You have to have lubrication for that. The whey oil is what lubricates those pieces moving. Of course, a little bit of that makes its way into the coolant, and if you get it wrong, well, a lot of bad things can happen if you get too much whey oil in your coolant. In your experience, what are the things you've seen that whey oil contamination can do to your coolant? A lot of it's bacteria growth. Mm -hmm. It'll contaminate your, it'll it'll create a rash in your hands. Right. It stinks real bad, so. Yeah, that Monday morning odor oftentimes is right. from the whey oil, because the whey oil actually is oil, but in the coolant typically isn't what we would consider oil. A lot of them are synthetics. Uh, so bacteria can eat mineral-based oils, which is typically what's in the whey oil. And so you want to keep that whey oil. I mean, sometimes foam is an issue too, that you can get a lot of uh, whey oil build up in the system can create foaming. And that's really not a good thing when you've got super high pressure pumps and right. things like that. So, all right, so we talked a little about how to filter it and all this. One thing we haven't touched on is the concentration, the ratio of water to coolant. So how do you maintain that? Uh, we have this tool, it's called a refractometer. And it's a gauge essentially, it measures the level of concentration. Correct. From zero to 10. Okay. Uh, you calibrate with a, drop, a couple drops of water. Just pure water, clean, so that- Just to zero it out. Mm -hmm. Then you apply a few drops of coolant, close the lid, and then you read through the sight glass, and it'll tell you your level of concentration. Right now we're at about six. Okay, so what's the recommended concentration for this particular fluid for this machining operation? We keep it between five and seven. Typically. Okay, five and seven, right, so six right in the middle. And just so people can know, obviously you're cutting a lot of aluminum here uh, for cylinders and such. But the concentration level will vary based on the material you're using, correct? Sometimes, yes. And uh, higher the concentration, it'll actually leave a film of oil on the machine See. so it doesn't rust overnight or anything like that. Okay, so uh, flash rusting, surface rusting, right. so on, the the machine, on the parts can also be an indication that you don't have enough coolant. Too, not, too yeah, much water. Too yeah. much water. Because what happens is, I mean, water sometimes can. Uh, evaporate out, but you also get drag out on the parts mm -hmm. from the coolant. So you got something, how often do you guys check and maintain your coolant? Usually every day. Every day. Yeah, now, every that's morning. usually pretty, typically good practice, you know. Yeah. Me being a certified lubrication specialist, aka oil nerd, yeah, mm -hmm. at, daily concentration checks are the way to go. So how fast can that spindle turn? This one does 14,000. 14,000. So 14,000 RPM, you need some coolant, you would need to have very good lubrication in order, and a lot of good cooling, this is why it's a coolant, a water-based, not an oil-based product to do this job, to get that cooling required to be able to cut at that speed. This also flushes the chips out of the part. Ah, yeah. 
shoot them straight out instead of recutting them or floating around, so it helps with that too. Again, surface finish, right? Exactly. It's all white. Uh, any other parting thoughts for anybody watching that's maybe new to having these machines and they, all they've learned is kind of old school machines, manual lays and uh, honing stuff where they really haven't got into the CNC machine, got into things that need coolant, uh, any kind of other advice specifically to maintain your coolant and how to make sure these machines work their best? Well, we check it every morning. Uh, we'll skim the tanks once a week, mm -hmm. if, maybe twice if, if necessary. Okay. Other than that, it just does its thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Matt, we appreciate your time. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. What a day, what a day, what a day. Uh, yeah, my, brain, my brain is swollen. I've learned so much today. They told us, don't start cars. We are not going to listen.